Hi, this is Tino with Bluesy News, and I'm here in the beautiful foothills of the San Gabriel Valley with composer, musician, music director, Frank Symes. At a very young age, at the age of 14, you find yourself in, in Japan, signed by a major label, RCA Records. How does that happen at 14? Well, I started playing guitar when I was 10. My front porch was my first stage, and I used to play with my next door neighbor, and we played Beatles and Ventures. And um, we had a lot of music at home, so I, I uh, listened to The Platters, Ray Charles, my mother listened to those uh, artists, and my sister listened to Elvis Presley and John Coltrane. So I, I had a nice spectrum of uh, genres that I was exposed to early on. I started playing guitar when I was 10. You know, I was a fervent uh, student, and I learned a lot. I picked up a lot of things. I'd been singing and reading notes since I was in the second grade, because I was in choir, so um, that came pretty naturally to me. So anyway, I played guitar. I was in a band, a uh, three-piece band, and I remember playing a sixth or seventh grade talent show. We played Jimi Hendrix, Hey Joe, and um, Purple Haze. Um, I had a few mentors, and they taught me, and I had, obviously, I had a facility, so by the time I was 14, I joined this band called Sunrise, which I named, and uh, one of the members was a already a famous musician in Japan, a celebrity of sorts. He was a child prodigy, organist that played with a band called the Golden Cups that I looked up to, revered. So when he wanted to form this band, he what happened was he got charged with drug charges and he had to quit the Golden Cups. That was one of um, the part of the sentence. And he had to cut his hair. And so he, he had to form a new band. He wanted to form a new band. And so uh, I knew friends uh, of his and who called me up and said, um, why don't we form a band? And that led to a producer coming down. Uh, there was a, a famous singer who had a crush on me. Her name is Ann Lewis. I produced five of her albums in recent past on various labels. And she brought her producer down, and the producer thought we were great. So that's how we got signed, and we put out a single. Interesting. How does, you're American, yeah. you're in Japan listening to American artists. Mm -hmm. How does that happen? Why were you there? Well, my father was legal attache for General Douglas MacArthur, and uh, he's what's called a judge advocate, which is a fancy word for a military lawyer. I grew, I was born in Japan, and I was under American jurisdiction, so I was a citizen, U.S. citizen by birth and from birth. I was, I grew up a part of the time in downtown Tokyo. The part of the last seven years of my life I spent uh, 30 miles south of Tokyo and we, for five of those years we lived on an army base called Camp Zama which is U.S. Army headquarters. My father worked in the tiny Pentagon. There's a tiny Pentagon on, uh, there and my, that's where my father worked. Now you're over there and you're 14, 15 years old, and the Woodstock movie comes out. Right. And you watched it about eight times? Yeah, that was a game-changing, life-changing moment for me. <clears throat> um, I went, I spent big allowance money, uh, and I saw it eight times in a row. And um, every time, you know, I loved everybody on the film. Joe Cocker, Alvin Lee, uh, you know, Country Joe and the Fish. But when I saw The Who come on, it took my breath away. I, I had never heard such amazing music. It, it struck me right away. So I guess I had a, a, an in, innate appreciation for uh, innovative music, um, because I would say that The Who represents that. I, I, I sensed that the moment I saw it, and I wanted to see that over and over, and after a while I just wanted to meld into the film, somehow surrealistically get into that film and be a part of that band. That was my fantasy when I was 14 or 15. A and it did happen. And so the fantasy came true, which is the most astounding and mysterious thing in my life. You know, in the music industry, you, f you thought one day you would meet probably these guys at least? Yeah, you know, uh, some they call it today in, um, in science, in brain science, intentionality. You know, you have intentions, you want to do something in life, you keep moving forward, and then sometimes you get there. That's what happened with me, and so when I met Roger Daltrey 12 years ago uh, in Los Angeles, where he had a charity band, um, he had fired two guitarists, one after another, and then he asked the band members if they knew a guy and who could play the Who and Roger's music, 
and the drummer who I had hired for Don Henley's band said, I know a guy. And there was another member, uh, an amateur guitar player, uh, Nigel Sinclair, who was a famous produ film producer. Um, he seconded the motion. He goes, yeah, Fran I follow Frank around. I sit in the front row on his side at every Don Henley concert, and he would be able to do the job. So I came in, and can I go on with the story? Absolutely. This is Plan B, the band, right? Plan B, right. Oh, no. Actually, this was just a charity band, and we were called The How. Okay. The How actually put out a record. So that's available. <laughs> Interesting. And I played, uh, I played uh, on, uh, on the uh, live recording. So um, anyway, I came in and I was tuning up my guitar and setting up my amp. And uh, Roger saunters in, mindlessly playing Behind Blue Eyes. Well, I knew the song, so I started playing along. And he looked up and noticed that it, he goes, oh, you know it. So he kept playing. He went up to the microphone stand and started singing the song, and I knew the background harmony, so I sang the background harmony. Mind you, I haven't met him yet. Wow. I, mean, I haven't shaken hands uh -huh. or introduced her. You know, we haven't introduced ourselves. So, right after we get through playing, he goes, well, that'll do. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he goes, Roger, and I, Frank, and then we, I, I was a part of the band.